Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vows and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in tube lab number 18, we're going to take a first look at the Russian 6N2P, also known as a 6AX7. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltage voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. And if you're enjoying these videos, please hit the like button and subscribe. 6H2N in the Russian or Cyrillic alphabet, or 6N2P in English, with a mil-spec version called the 6H2N-EB, or in English-EV, is a very interesting tube that is virtually the same tube as a 12AX7 with the exception of the heater voltage. Let's take a quick look at one. So here is a Voskhod rocket. You can see the wonderful black rocket and you know it's an early rocket tube because it's got the fading black printing on it. This one actually retained its date 1964 and we'll look at some later rocket logos that are a lot different than this. It's still a rocket, but it's smaller and it's printed differently. Now, very typical of these tubes is that they all have short boxy plates that are open on the sides with either a square or a rectangular opening, some large, some small, and they all have a shield in between them. Let me get that up close for you so that you can see it. There it is, right in the middle. You see that gray shield? That divides the two sections of the tube up and provides um, an electrical shield between the sections. And we'll look more at that in a minute. In fact, let's get out um, a pinout sheet. This comes from Blue Glow's website. I'll put a link um, at the bottom. David Blue Glow is a great guy. He does wonderful YouTubes on tube amp builds and other electrical things related to tubes. And the pinout sheet is one of the ones that I use quite frequently. So one of the most common miniature nine pins, which is what we're talking about, is the 9A base, and that's for the 12AX7. One of the other very common bases is the 9AJ, and that's for the very common 6DJ8, as well as the 6N2P, and a bunch of other tubes as well. The important thing to note is electrically the connections of these two tubes, not the shield and not the heaters, but the electrical connections of the circuit are identical. Pin one is the plate, pin two is the grid, and pin three is the cathode. If you look over here, it's a mirror image, but that doesn't matter, folks. It's just on the other side of the tube. Pin one is the plate, pin two is the grid, and three is the cathode. And of course, the other sections are the same. Where the differences lie is with the heater. Now, the 12AX7 and all the tubes in that series basically have a universal heater. You can do virtually anything you want with this thing. You can run it at 6 volts, 12 volts. You can run it in series, string them together. All kinds of ways to wire them. But typically, the most common way today you'll wire it is you'll bring 12 volts AC or DC. The heater doesn't care. I use DC because I like lower noise in my preamp builds you'll bring 12 volts DC to pins 4 and 5 and you won't connect 9 to anything. It'll be left open. On a 6N2P or 9AJ base, you've got pins 4 and 5 or the heater again, but you can only bring 6 volts AC or DC. And pin 9 is the shield. We were just looking at one and they actually physically show the metal shield in between, it divides, remember these, these are twin triodes, two electronic circuits inside of a single tube. So we physically have a metal shield and it goes to pin nine. Okay, let's pull out some data sheets and quickly look at some comparisons. This is a wonderful one by Phelps for the ECC83, that's the European designation of the 12AX7 says right here, AF double triode. AF stands for audio frequency double triode. You could also call this a twin triode because they're identical sections. 
amplification factor is U, 100. U, MU, and gain are all the same thing. Put in 1 millivolt, and you get out approximately 100 millivolts. Amplification of 100. Heater voltage, 6.3 with a current of 300 milliamps. Or at 12.6, half as much at 150 milliamps. So it's not hard to see why running it at low current is always better. It's not hard to see why people will run this at 12.6. Okay, let's flip through here quickly. I'm not going to go over all of the statistics. The tubes are not identical. They're just very close to each other. And you can substitute one for the other in most cases. This is, Philips did a wonderful thing for us. They gave us a very typical um, voltage amplifier circuit using the 12AX7. And here we will see the resistors in place. There's the cathode resistor down here, RK, the bypass capacitor on it. And then they'll give the typical operating points, starting with your supply voltages, and then they'll tell you the electrical components for each of these various um, set points. So a really easy and handy reference. And that is basically taken from this graph right here. It's just a really quick and speedy way to, to set your values. Okay, and of course the, all the operating points of every tube is done in this manner. And this is too short a video to get into describing how this goes, but there's lots of great ones out there if you want to go into it deeper. So let's look at this, the limiting values. This, that's what we're really concerned about when we're substituting tubes. Anode voltage, this is the uh, maximum surge voltage. We're not concerned about that. The maximum current, the, the maximum continuous voltage is 300. That's identical to uh, the Russian version. We'll look at that in a minute. And the other critical thing we want to look at is the anode dissipation. It's a maximum of one watt. That's how much power the tube can handle. And these typically are not current amplifiers. They are voltage amplifiers. So you'll see that they, they really can't dissipate that much in the way of current. If this was a power tube, it would be the other way around. It would have a very high current handling capability. So this is for the mil spec version, the 6N2PEV. But the mil spec and the standard version are identical in uh, most respects. We're going to find probably um, that it can handle more vibration, that it, it's going to have a longer heated life, but the actual maximum and operating points are the same. So the heater runs only at 6.3 volts, and the heater current's at 340, plus or minus 25. I know it's hard to read this. This is actually a, a high-def laser printer, so the original source material wasn't that good. So 340 is a little over the 12AX7 of 300. That's your heater current. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Higher here, heater current can lead to higher reliability in the tube. Amplification factor is 100 plus or minus 15, so it's identical to 12AX7. Let's look at some other key critical things here. Limiting values of operating. Heater is 6.6, .6, and we'll talk about that in a minute. That's important to note. And the anode is 300. That's the same as the 12AX7. Okay. Normally, I would give a brief history of the tube, but there isn't much available online in English. What we do know is that RCA invented the 12AX7 in 1946 and released it in 1947. So most likely the Russians copied the technology and improved upon it at the same time. My oldest 6N2Ps date back to the 1950s. So far I've only come across three Russian factories that made these tubes. Voskhod, you know with the famous rocket logo, Reflector, another well-known manufacturer, and Photon. 
But if we lack for variety as far as manufacturers go, we certainly don't as far as various types and years of 6N2P. To test these circuits, these tubes, I designed and built a dual mono phono preamp and modified an existing line stage preamp that used a 12AX7. And it worked surprisingly well. But I learned a couple of things along the way. Number one, these tubes prefer pin 9 to be connected to ground. Some work fine with it left open, but most prefer it connected to ground. Number two, they really don't like the heater voltage set too high. My SMPS, short for Switch Mode Power Supply, or Power Brick, that I like to use for preamps provides exactly 7 volts DC and up to 2.14 amps, and that is too much for these tubes. After I dropped it to 6.3 volts, all was good. Let's take a quick look at this. These are wonderful little units. It's easy to find the 12 volts units even used at a very good price, but 6 and 7 volt units are really hard to find with a higher output around 2 amps, which is what you really need for a tube amp. They come with a standard IEC connection, and uh, they don't it's not included with this, but most people have dozens of these things lying around the closet. And it's a universal transformer, so it'll take an input of 100 to 240 volts AC and it outputs 7 volts DC at 2.14 amps. And they've turned out to be really good. Uh, keep those in stock. Okay. Number three. You need to go through a lot of tubes to find good ones. Some don't light up, so they're DOA, or dead on arrival. Some are very mismatched. Remember, these are twin diodes, so two identical circuits inside one envelope. And in many circuits, you need both sections to amplify the voltage at the same rate, or close matched, as we say. And lastly, some are just noisy. In fact, many of them are noisy. They work, but who wants all that background noise? Just take a look at the rejects from the last few weeks. In fact, um, last week I had a large order of 6N1Ps on the tester, and the failure rate was 44%. 44%. Now, in most cases, the manufacturer, the suppliers will make good on that, and they'll just return 44% of the purchase price. In fact, most sellers uh, that are wholesalers and bulk sellers normally make good. Okay, enough blah blah blah. How did the 6N2P sound and how did they compare to a good 12AX7? Up first is my number 262 Voscod Rocket from 1964. Now we've already had a quick look at it. How did they sound? Bass was good, plus. Good tone and a bit forward. Mid range was good, plus. Natural and neutral. Treble was very nice. Clean, clear, and crisp. Very well defined. The tube was very quiet. In fact, all these select tubes were very quiet. In my notes, I wrote detail, sound stage, exclamation mark. Piano notes were very realistic, and everything just popped. Now, in case you don't know, when you're testing equipment, Piano notes are really a key indicator as to whether or not everything is working well. You would think that a single piano note would be a very easy thing to record and reproduce on a sound system, but in fact it's just the opposite. They're difficult to record properly and they're difficult to reproduce. So when I was doing my initial testing with my uh, phono preamp, that's what I turned to, some wonderful jazz piano. And it, wasn't, it didn't take long for me to realize that I had to tweak the high frequencies. And then I went back and forth until I got them right. Okay. Up next is my number 180 Voscod Rocket 6N2P-EV from 1987. Let's just take a quick look at them. So EV, so this is a mil-spec tube. Let's see if you can see the modern rocket logo. It's right there at the top. They're really faint. I 
not sure if they're printed or if they're etched. I think they're printed. So with the uh, mill spec tubes, you get um, coated plates. People will call that a silver plate. You get a silver shield and you get tinned pins as well. And presumably you get more vibration capabilities, the ability to withstand higher G's, so an aircraft use, and um, a longer life heater. But how did they sound? Bass was good. Mid-range and treble was good plus. Overall a good tube, but some of the magic was missing. Next is my number 181 or 182 reflector 6N2P. This one is from 1964. So there's your reflector label, the, the elongated circle or egg with a box through it. You can see the 6H2N, I think, pretty clearly on this tube. Now, you're going to find all Russian tubes are labeled in, their, in the Cyrillic alphabet, but when they're sold online, uh, in English, they always sell them with the English uh, translation, with few exceptions, and that goes for all Russian tubes. So don't go searching for a 6H2N. Go searching for a 6N2P. And these tubes are nice because the dates usually are intact. So 64 here, and the month is the ninth month. Now this tube is an interesting tube. It doesn't have the mil spec designation, the dash EB at the end, but it's got a, a coated plate, it's got a silver shield, and it's got tin pins. So what is this tube? Is it a mil spec tube? Was it just made for industry or was it released to the consumer marketplace and didn't get the mil spec designation? Maybe it doesn't have the a longer life heater, but I suspect that these are just simply mil spec tubes that didn't have the extension on them. Okay, but how did they sound? Bass was good plus plus, with nice tone and a wee bit forward. Okay, let's call it very nice bass. Mid-range is very nice, crisp, clean, and clear. In the mid-range, it's interesting how vocals appear to come from nowhere. I think what's going on is that the background noise is so low that shield is doing its work, that the silent bits before a singer comes in is just really quiet. These tubes are very, very detailed with a wonderful sound stage. Music just pops. They remind me a bit of the E80CC that we looked at a while back. Overall, a very nice tube. I'm going to award this tube best overall. Next is my number 263, Photon 6N2P from 1960. Let's take a quick look at them. So here we have the gray plates. This is the most common you're going to find. It's got an upper shield, or an upper mica. So a third mica spacer up here. And that, of course, is to reduce uh, noise and make the tube more rigid. And of course, it's got the openings on the side. But how did they sound? Bass was good. Mid-range was good plus, with lovely tone and a bit forward. Treble was good as well. Clean, clear, and crisp, with nice sparkle. Overall, a nice tube. Up last, but not least, is my number 240-89. Voskhod Rocket 6N2P, all from 1989. This is the most common version available today and cheap as chips. Let's take a quick look at them. So you've got your modern logo. Got a nice date on the bottom of these tubes if it remained. In this case it's 8907, so the seventh week of 89. We've got a flat boxy gray plate with a very large side opening. These Suckers, they because you can see right through the operating tube, right through the heater element that runs up through the middle, these tubes glow beautifully. They look gorgeous. 
and of course we've got a gray shield. Let's look at the very top. This is very common. The getters on Russian tubes are typically these cup-shaped uh, circular getters called flying saucers. They really help you identify a Russian tube if you're not sure if you've got one. And they help weed out fakes as well. Keep an eye on the getter because nobody else, as far as I know, makes those flying saucers other than the Russians. But how did they sound? Bass was very nice. Great tone. Well-defined and slightly forward. Mid-range was good and treble was very nice plus. Clean, clear and crisp. Forward and detailed. Almost too much of a good thing. Now I run large soft dome tweeters mounted in a waveguide and they are very efficient. So I'm going to notice high frequencies that are turned up a bit. And it wasn't too much for me, but I like my treble forward. Maybe because back in the day, so many systems lacked treble. Well, they lacked mid-range and bass as well. Anyways, if your system is a tad lacking in treble, this is your tube. And if you run a metal dome, horn-loaded beast, these may be too much. I enjoyed the sound of these tubes so much, I forgot I was working and just eased back into my chair and enjoyed the music for a while. Given how inexpensive these tubes are, I'm going to award them a Best Buy. When I first started working on this episode during the Christmas break, I wondered if I would be able to tell the difference from one manufacturer to another, or even one year to another. And after doing all this listening, I can say with certainty these tubes vary a lot, even within a single manufacturer. In short, the 6NT2P would be a good substitute for the 12AX7. Let's just take a quick look at a modern Russian 12AX7. This is a Gentle X. I reviewed them when I looked at the 12AX7s. And they've got, this is the Gold Lion. That's their brand, ECC83, which is the European designation for the 12AX7. They've got a, a long, flat gray plate with a couple of ribs on it, three ribs. No openings on this plate. Some 12AX7s would have, um, like the Muller, would have a small circular opening right in the middle of the side, on each side. Many of them don't have any openings at all. So a very different looking plate structure. And because this is a long plate, we would call this a long plate, a long gray plate 12AX7. So what is this? This is a this is a short boxy 12AX7 plate. <laughs> Anyways, enough fooling around. If you're a custom builder, it would be easy to use this instead of a 12AX7. Just provide six volts for the heater instead of 12. And if you're handy and have an existing amp running the 12AX7, in many cases it isn't a big deal to switch the heater voltages and drop the B plus to 250 volts DC if it's too high. Okay, that was fun. Let's take a quick look at what came in this week. Oh, and there they are. And my Wilsonton integrated amp is finally on the move and should be here next month. I've got hundreds of vintage 6SL7s and EL34s to test and get ready for the Wilsonton series I've got planned. I know many of you are looking forward to it. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's a great amp at a great price. And we're going to look at the vintage tubes that you can use in it. And here's something neat that came in the post just yesterday pair of these beauties. Everyone knows that one of my favorite 6SN7s is the Sylvania GT Bad Boys made in the 1940s, 50s, and I think I've got my latest one ever, 1962, I think, if that code is correct. I believe that's pretty close to the last year. And we're not going to go into too many details other than to take a look at the testing results on this. This is a nominal 100% as new old stock and these are beautifully balanced sections. It's unusual to find a 70 year old tube that close. And the reason why it's that close is take a look at the base folks. 
Look at the lettering. This is a new old stock too. It's never been plugged in. And here's another one. It's very close. Mat this is more typical for a close matched bad boy. That's still a very good measurement. That's inside of 6%. Now you can see the difference. The lettering is a little bit faded. The base shows a tiny bit of wear. This actually is a tube that's been used but not very much. So also a wonderful tube to have come into my into my store. And if you watched till the end, here are some discount codes that you can use as often as you would like. Remember I've got flat rate shipping of $20 globally and if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping is on me. Use these codes as often as you like. Stay safe everyone. This is Jim from Vowels and More signing off. Cheers everyone.